Hello, I'm Sora Luxon, and this is Magic Lesson 33, Asserting Presence. I've received a question on foot stomping. Yes, foot stomping, actually hitting the ground with your foot from a viewer, and I'm going to explain that. But I wanted to point out really quickly that it was this question that provoked my own intuition that this is the right time to begin discussing the projection of power. We're 32 lessons deep if you've been listening to all these lessons, so it only seemed fitting that lesson 33 were probably ready to start getting into some of these more detailed, powerful tools that you could be using, right? So when it comes to the projection of power, which can also be called asserting presence, which is a far less intimidating label for people to hear and absorb and comprehend correctly, That has a lot to do with foot stomping. So I'm going to answer that question on foot stomping. The question posed to me is, what are occultists doing when they stomp their foot sometimes and gesture shh? Is that something I should be doing? So first off, the signal of silence, that hand gesture that you're referring to, because it is a hand gesture where you bring one forefinger directly to your own closed lips, what we all know as the shh sign, right? That is a movement that has many names and many different traditions. But if you go far enough back, they all have their genesis from ancient Egypt, which you can, of course, look into more if you choose to. In the early neophyte grades of Hermetic and Enochian magical systems, such as what I personally have a background in, this gesture of sacred silence is introduced very early and has correspondent implications and evolutions descendant from the occulted teachings of Hippocrates. And it's a part of a larger ceremonial system when it's employed with the foot stomping because they're both done at the same time, right? The gesture of silence and the foot stomp is done together right? All of what I just said was very informative, but possibly also really boring and not necessarily the most important description of what is actually happening when a magical practitioner does this, uses this gesture with the foot stomp, which is literally when they inhale sharply while bringing their forefinger to their now hermetically sealed closed lips, thus protectively sealing in the breath of life in full hermetic silence and also stomping firmly on the ground with the right foot as they're making this shh gesture, right? What's actually happening in that gesture or in that moment for the magic user is a very profound and powerful application of self-shielding where an energetic shield is actually being pushed out and around the entire form of the body while sealing in the self. I'm not going to go into all of the symbolism and meaningful esoteric knowledge of the child god form Hippocrates or of silence itself as being intensely sacred within hermetic magics and not because I'm keeping secrets, but because to do so, to go into all of that, it would take forever and it would strip those listeners who might wish to seek that knowledge in those paths for themselves it would strip them from their own initiate mystery interpretation of them right explaining them would take away their ability to define what it is for themselves the first time they come into contact with it taking the mystery away from things by explaining them to others from my own experience, which is going to be colored by my own perspectives, right? Before someone else, before they've had the opportunity to have that experience for themselves, that isn't what I'm about. What I will get into in some detail is explaining the fundamentals that are going to be completely up to you if you use them, how you're going to experience them. So a fundamental that, yes, the gesture of silence along with a good firm foot stomp is an initiated tool of the trade. It's an actual thing to both seal and protect the self while conveying firm authority into a space. 
That's what the foot stomping really is, right? That's what it does. It conveys authority. That's part of what it's doing. It's bringing you into direct physical contact with your intention that you're projecting. Much like giving your altar a nice hard wrap of the knuckles, right? A knock. After closing a circle in order to close a magical temple space maybe. Or cracking the butt of a staff on the ground on a hard surface during a ceremony or knocking hard on a door on the side of a wall or altar. All of those things, right? These physical impetus, noise generating activities inside of a magical ceremony, they are a means of asserting the presence and authority of the individual energetic user into the surrounding space. So the person who's knocking is conveying their their authority into the space and possibly over various elements, entities, wanted or unwanted vibrations that might be a play because sound is a vibration. That that's science. So the sound created by a ceremonial magician by his will and fully under his or her control That is a focused vibration of intention, which has very real energetic implications. Now, as for whether or not you should foot stomp, because you said, should I be doing that? You can, if you like, it can't hurt and it can't help. It's going to be far more useful to you if you go back and take the time to learn how to use this tool correctly, right? Because like any tool, knowing how to use it correctly is going to make it more powerful. Like all other initiate mysteries, there is a technique and purpose to what's going on with that specific small ritual. And it's only in comprehension of the technique and purpose that you're really going to unlock for yourself the power that's available there, that potential involved. But... In general, I'd say it never hurts to knock or ring a bell or stomp at the end of any sort of ceremony, especially if you want to authoritatively end it or close it entirely. I know many Neo-Wiccans, for instance, that have no formal training, right? No hermetic high magics training who work mostly with low magics and aren't really coming from any formalized tradition who still ring a bell or knock on their altar after even the simplest meditative ceremony, right? Because even meditation in front of an altar, that is a ritual, it's a ceremony. And ringing a bell after doing that, even if you don't necessarily know why, it can be used to great effect. I've seen it used to great effect. It clears the space and asserts control. You don't need occulted knowledge in order to have that skill of ringing a bell and sensing that it's working. I'm trying to think of a better way to explain this. I once asked someone with no background in formal magic why they rang this little bell that they had. And it worked, but I was asking them why they were doing it after their own individualized, very self-created daily blessings ritual that they simply did sitting on a mat in front of a candle. And then they would ring this bell when they were finished. And I asked them why they did that because it was clear that it wasn't coming from a trained background. And they responded with something along the lines of, I ring this bell because I do. I can't explain it. I just know it's right. The room feels normal again after I do this. And that was it. And of course, they were absolutely correct without ever really knowing why they were correct. Right? And they didn't need to know why in order for it to work fully, completely, and well for them. It was intuition generating an ancient and well-known magical practice into their own Wiccan magical workings without anyone having to teach them to do it or explain to them why it was doing whatever it was doing. It wasn't necessary. For instance, you don't need to have formalized Enochian occult training to know that drum circles are powerful, right? So... Sound coupled directly with movement of the physical body generates a very real field. 
or a wave if you prefer sound wave if you're coming at this from a scientific perspective right but it does it creates a field both in physical reality and on other planes like a psychological plane like the subconscious right which is very real and very powerful and there's more to it than that which you can find for yourself by use and experience working with this specific tool. But when it comes to asserting presence, taking authority, having and maintaining control, producing power over a space, right? Over different planes, entities, elements, closing circles, banishing entities, a good hard stomp or knock with the right and focused intention behind it is going to work every single time. Now, in opposition to the magical no-nonsense method of asserting your own presence powerfully, right, is another useful occult technique known as the Rose Cross. Because polarity, remember, I'm always going on and on about polarity. So if there are ways to project and promote, right, to take authority and control, then there must also be ways to withdraw and concede to humbly remove yourself in order to protect yourself. And you can choose from either side of that equation in how you approach handling any event which might require you to protect yourself in some way. You can either authoritatively take control or you can protect yourself by the opposing polar force of humbly stepping away from the situation. The ritual of the Rose Cross does the latter. It steps away. It conceals. And it's also invaluable when it comes to finding your center, creating space and time to rebalance, finding the space you need to then be able to retake your authority and begin expressing it outwards again. If you feel like you're under attack from stuff, people, things, whatever is going on, whatever negativity, give the Rose Cross a go. You can find the ceremony online. I'm not going to go into it step by step for you here because so many other people have done so already so very well. There are great step by step instructions available on YouTube on how to do the Rose Cross ritual. So you can find the ceremony online. And yes, just walking through the steps on purpose and willfully, that is going to help. And it's going to clear a space and start to give you more energetic control. Even if you've never been initiated into anything, even if you have no idea what you're doing or why you're doing it, even if you think you are horrible at magic or producing or generating magical power, this ceremony, the Rose Cross ceremony, is still going to help if you do it while wanting it to work. You do need to know that the ritual of the Rose Cross is different than the ritual of the Kabbalistic Cross, where the Kabbalistic Cross ceremony results in powerful projection, which lights everything up. The Rose Cross is shielding, right? It's withdrawing. It makes unfindable. It shrouds instead of highlighting. The Rose Cross will result in you being ignored, but not only being ignored by enemies and just about every bad thing right until you feel strong and centered enough to reassert your powers again it's going to result in you being ignored by just about everything so you need to be aware of that you just need to be conscientious of it that you'll probably need to yell to be heard and you'll probably need to wave your arms to be seen in a way that you're not used to Just in general, after a well-generated, powerful Rose Cross ceremony, you'll find yourself repeating yourself to friends and family a lot, for instance, because they didn't hear you the first time. Or bicyclists might nearly run over you on a sidewalk by accident, right? (laughs) Because they just didn't see you standing there. That sort of thing is probably going to happen. So you just be conscientious of it, right? Because the Rose Cross really does shroud and conceal, And that's the trade-off. It will shroud and conceal. It will make you invisible from whatever or whoever is bothering you until those things lose interest and wander off because they can't find you to mess with you anymore. But it also means that 
the barista at Starbucks is going to get your order wrong and leave you waiting a really long time because they couldn't quite hear you when you were talking and then they can't quite see you fully and attentively while you're waiting. So just be aware of that. Something else to consider, to just keep in mind, is something I've said before that there can be a very real tendency with shielding rituals and practices to then start approaching daily life ready to throw your shields up against every enemy. And that's not to say that those enemies aren't real, that they aren't coming at you, but only that suddenly, for some people, I've seen this happen, daily life can become a constant need to create a shield to protect themselves from other stuff. And that is not the most powerful way to deal with enemies. And I'm not saying those enemies aren't real. I'm just saying they're going to keep coming at you. And it's it would be better, rather than having to raise your shield over and over and over again to protect yourself, don't have enemies in the first place, right? Find a way to stop the enemy from coming at you in the first place, and then you won't have to be raising these protective shields. And one of the most powerful ways to do that, something to really consider, is a reflective technique that involves, let's make a metaphor with a real enemy here. Let's say someone's gossiping about you. Someone's talking badly about you behind your back, right? So your first instinct might be to become defensive about that enemy that's maybe causing problems for you in your career or in your home life or who knows, right? That they're doing this negative thing that's causing you real detriment and you might want to either banish them or raise a shield and hide yourself or protect yourself. But rather than doing all that, which you're then going to have to keep doing, if not with them, possibly with someone else, What you can choose to do is rather than becoming defensive and reactive, appreciate them for what they're doing and send back kindness, love, generosity. And I'm not saying you have to do that in person, right? I'm not saying as someone's cursing at you in person, you need to be saying to them, I love you. What I'm saying is that in private, say if someone's gossiping about you behind your back, that what you can do in private is take a few moments to send real positivity towards them, to sit with a projection of graceful kindness. So where they're attacking you with focused negativity, respond to it, not with more negativity or with the need to protect yourself, but respond to it instead with its polar opposite, positivity. You don't like me. I'm going to sit here in private in silence and like you. What that's going to do it's, it creates a powerful reflective barrier where what's happening is the negativity now being focused at you is returned to sender. And it's not returned to sender in a bad way. You're not wishing someone harm. What's happening is that negativity is coming at you and you're wishing them positivity. So the negativity is returned to its sender without you ever wishing them any harm. You're wishing only the best from them, right? And then that, what they have projected onto you that you didn't accept and take in, they then have the option of taking it in and learning from it and dealing with it and therefore not doing it anymore or, right, wandering away to find someone else that they can harm because they can't harm you. Because when negativity is leveled at you, when someone's being mean to you, you respond with being just that more fulfilled, just that much happier, And it really is. It sounds like a simple thing. It really is this powerful reflective tool that will return negativity to its sender so that if you do it enough, you're going to have less negativity leveled at you in the first place. Your enemies are going to wander away and you're not going to keep running into them every day, right? They're going to find easier targets and then you won't have to be doing constant banishings, shieldings, or ritualistic work to protect yourself. You'll do those things because you choose to, because they feel good to you, when and if you need to. But you won't be needing to do them all the time because you'll have far fewer, if any, enemies in the first place. And that is masterful. 
So that is something to keep in mind. And also, in closing, I just want to say yet again that I'm grateful. I'm grateful for you. Gratitude is the attitude, right? (laughs) But I'm grateful that you take the time to listen to this. I'm thankful that you're interested. I'm thankful that you're out there doing you, right? I'm thankful that you're not me. I'm thankful that in our own ways, we're allowing some light into ourselves and through us into this whole place. I'm not much for paying attention to things like views or numbers, But I have noticed, right, that my earlier lessons, some of my first lessons are up to a couple hundred views, which is not something I really ever expected. And I've also seen that I have a handful of subscribers of actual people that are constantly and actively following these little YouTube podcasts, right? These little Let's Talk About Actual Magic series. And I'm thankful for that. I'm not thankful because I'm seeking that out, right? I I don't actually care if I'm popular or followed. What I'm thankful for is that those people and you, as you're listening to this, I'm thankful to you just for being there, just for existing as you are. And it's seeing it that reminds me of it and draws it back to the foreground of my intention and my attention, right? but I'm thankful that you're just there. I'm thankful that you exist while I happen to exist. I've probably said this before, but Einstein had this beautiful quote about how even though he was a loner, that he was very conscientious that he belonged to this invisible community of people who strive for truth and beauty and ideals like justice, right? And that knowing that prevented him from ever feeling lonely, right? That he had this very real awareness that even though he was a loner in daily life, even when he was entirely privately alone, he was also highly aware of being a part of this bigger community of individuals who were there for him just the way he was there for them without them ever having to come into contact with each other, right? And that's the sense and genuine appreciation that I have for you. So thank you. Thank you. Until next time.